Good morning. And welcome to Winterstown on this beautiful autumn morning. Um, just a few news and notes to review. Um, one important one, I think, is the baked good donations that are needed for the live nativity weekend. Um, don't forget that. There's um, sign-up sheets and to contact Beth Kobe. Also, um, United Methodist Women will be sponsoring the Christmas cover dish again this year on December 14th at 6 p.m. here in the all-purpose room. Um, a sign-up sheet is on the bulletin board in the narthex. And also tomorrow afternoon at 1 p.m., the officers and the work area chairs will meet in the conference room to plan for 2016. Um, we have a couple people who want to make announcements. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd just like to say that over the past couple weeks, there's been a lot of activity going on in here in the church, which is great. Uh, I know during the first service last week, there was a lot of talk about the different activities and going on, so to speak. The one thing I'd like to just tag along with that is it's great to have all the activities, and we really appreciate it, and we certainly want to continue all the activities. But something we need to ask of the people in charge of the activities is that the end of the activity, please let's make sure we get the lights turned off, get the doors locked, and just secure the building as we found it when we come in in the evenings. Uh, we're finding uh, feedback from people coming down later in the evenings or the next morning. We're finding lights that are left on, doors that are left open. Uh, we certainly want to use the facility because that's what it's here for. We want to have the, the outreach, the missions, the study groups, whatever's going on. Please continue all that. But if you are someone that's in charge of these activities, take the responsibility to lock up the doors, turn the lights out, and enjoy whatever you're doing. Thank you. Good morning. Good to see everyone. I just want to announce that we will be going as a mission team on a mission trip in the summer of 2017. We don't know where we're going, don't have any details yet. But as many of you know, they, these cost money. So we are actually starting our fundraising now. We will be selling Texas Roadhouse gift cards. Okay, so there's no extra cost to anyone. They just charge us 10% less, so we make 10% on the cards. There is a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board if you would like to purchase cards. Um, we are doing it for two weeks, so we have them back in time that if you would like to purchase any for Christmas gifts, that they would be here. If you feel so compelled and would like to try to sell some for us, we have packets that you can see Dick or I and um, sell them for us to family or work, and they're pretty easy to sell. Jill did it for her Colleges Against Cancer last year, and I ended up being the top seller, and I really just stuck it up at work. So uh, I appreciate all your help, and keep this whole mission group in your prayers. Thank you. Good morning. I just want to thank everybody that helped out yesterday and helped out all summer with getting vegetables and everything with the canning. Uh, I want to give you a quick breakdown of what we've taken in yesterday. Uh, and this is the total. We have bills uh, such as the food and things like that that's going to come off of here. But uh, in the food and the bake sale area, they took in 1,117.75. And in the candy cane shop, where they had the donated Christmas items, they took in 244.61. And it was all donations. And if somebody had a little item that should have only been a quarter, they paid the ladies $5 for it. So they did a fabulous job in there. And uh, the canned goods. Uh, prior to the sale, we took in 529, and yesterday we took in 42906 on canned items, and we still have some that need to be picked up and paid for. So I have a total here of 95806, but we're going to exceed $1,000 till everybody picks up. 
and we still have canned items. We canned lots when our farmer got us all the cauliflower and extra stuff to make it. So we have extra and we'll sell it till it's all sold out. And it's down in the all-purpose room. And Glenda will be taking care of that once I leave for Florida. And the vendor spaces, uh, we had 29 paying spaces. We had other spaces that like the scouts and our gift area and uh, Pat that was selling for the church. Uh, we didn't charge those. Uh, but with the tables and all the spaces, we took in 535. And we had a grand total of 2,855.42 that we took in yesterday. So that's the candy cane craft show for this year. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, birthdays this week. Before I get into those, I want to remind also the... Um, Betty Landis is having an 80th birthday coming on Thursday. If you would like and be able to send her a card, probably should get in the mail early this week. Um, her address is in the bulletin this week. And Betty was uh, the wife of a former pastor that we had here for quite some time. So a lot of us know her. Birthdays this week, Tuesday, Ava Grove. Wednesday, Ethan Criswell. Thursday, Joyce McElroy. Saturday, Joseph Tora Grossa. And anniversaries this week, Wednesday, is Glenn and Donna Grove, and Friday is Jay and Lori Beaver. And if there's nothing else, we will go into our time of fellowship. So if we would like to get up and welcome each other this morning.
One other short announcement is um, we should remember that today is charge conference. There is a light luncheon immediately following the worship service. And Pastor Mitch said he hopes that the conference will actually start by about 1230. So that's important. Um, anyone is welcome to come out and attend that. Also, there was a birthday that was missed this Friday is Linda Deerdorf's birthday. So happy birthday there. <laughs> Okay, and don't forget to use the hand sanitizer on the end of the aisles. It's getting to be flu season, and we'd like to contain it as much as possible. If we would please rise and join in the call to worship. is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Now to him who sits upon the throne of the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and mighty forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And now we'll sing joyful, joyful, we adore you. <laughs> you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Welcome you to our worship service this morning. It's good to have all of you with us today on another beautiful Lord's Day today. We bring before the Lord now our joys and our concerns, and if you have a joy or concern, uh, we will bring the microphone around to you.
for Pastor Mitch as he has another round of chemo uh, this week, round two. Yep. And four to go. Now that is play. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we bow before you this morning, we come humbly, knowing that it is not what we have said this week, it's not what we have done this week, it's not the things we have accomplished that give us the privilege of bowing in your presence, but rather your heart desires that we should be with you, and so you have promised us that wherever two or more are gathered in your name, there you are in the very midst of them. So we come with confidence this morning, Father, knowing that you are here in this place and you have heard the quiet prayers that have been offered in our hearts as well as those that have been spoken. We do pray today for those persons who will be traveling. We pray for uh, <coughs> Troy and for Julie and for Bob and Lois as they travel back from Connecticut. We ask that you be with them and comfort their hearts as they went to share in the funeral of Bob's brother, we would just ask that you would be with them and watch over them and keep them safe. We rejoice this morning that you were with Anne McGinnis these past few weeks and the good news that she shared with us this morning, Father, that uh, her radiations are finished and that she's doing well. And then we also give you thanks, oh God, for the ministries that you have given us. What a variety we have and what a wonderful time we have when we gather together in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I thank you for those who have taken the responsibility of leadership and who lead us in these various activities. We also come before you today knowing that we are your servants, and as servants we are called to care for those in this world. And perhaps the most important thing we can do is to pray for them. And so it is that we pray for, <coughs> for those persons who lost their lives this week, the innocent ones in France. We pray that you would be with their families as they try to make sense of a senseless act. We ask, O oh God, that you give to them the, the hope that beyond this world there is another kingdom, not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens. And then our sincere prayer is lifted once again for the power of your Holy Spirit to indwell the hearts of those who would carry out such evil acts. We know, O oh God, that this is not your plan. But we also know that your plan will prevail and there will be peace on earth. We ask that you continue to help us to be peacemakers in whatever way we can. We thank you for our missionaries. We pray that you be with Diana as, or Diana as she returns home and with all of those who were with her. Keep them safe on their journey. And now we lift these prayers before you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever. Amen. And now let us continue in a spirit of prayer as we share together in our prayer
Now the choir will share their anthem this morning, Lean Jesus. It is our joy now to be able to bring before God our tithes and our offerings.
we do bring you praise, O God, for all the gifts of life that you have blessed us with. And we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you will enable us to use these gifts wisely, that others may come to know of your love and of your faithfulness. I thank you, Father, for those who continue to give of themselves in so many different ways. And we ask now your blessing upon them and upon these gifts. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. You be seated. Did you hear about the young preacher who was preaching his first sermon in his first church? And he got up to preach, and he, he read the scriptures, and that went well, and he did the prayer, and that went well. And he began the sermon by saying, Behold, I come. And then he forgot what comes next. So he thought back to when he was in seminary, and the professor said, you know, when you have those uh, kind of moments, just step back, relax, and start over again. So he took one step back, and then he came forward, and he said, Behold, I come. And nothing came to his mind. So he thought maybe if he took three steps back, he'd have a little bit better chance because he'd have a little longer to think about it. And uh, so he stepped back three steps, came rushing towards the pulpit, said, Behold, I... And at that point, the pulpit left loose, and he went head over tail, out over top the pulpit and into the lap of Mrs. Murphy in the front pew. Well... He was so embarrassed, as you can just imagine. And he apologized to her, and finally she said, Oh, Pastor, it's okay. You warned me three times, and I didn't move. <laughs> well, our scripture lesson this morning is a warning not to move, but to watch and to listen. And it comes from the 13th chapter of Mark's Gospel, where Jesus is with his disciples. Now, I'm going to be all over this 13th chapter today because Mark didn't write this in the order that I wanted him to. So you're going to have to follow along. If you have your Bible, I'll try to get you to the right place. We're going to start at the first verse today. Mark says that as Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones! And what wonderful buildings. Jesus said to him, You see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Then, as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, which is opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, they said, Tell us when these things will take place and what will be the sign when all of these things are accomplished. Jesus began to say to them, Take heed that no one leads you astray. Oh, there will be many who will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear about wars, and when you hear about rumors of wars, do not be alarmed, for these things must take place. But this is not the end yet. For nations will rise against nation, and kingdoms against kingdoms. There will be earthquakes in, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in various places, and there will be famine. But take heed to yourselves. <coughs> Excuse me, fighting a cold. But take heed to yourselves, for they were designed by God. This is the reading of these first eight verses. Now, <coughs> excuse me. They ask him the question. After they looked at that great, big, beautiful temple, a temple that for them was the center of their whole lives. It's where they found meaning and purpose for life. It was built by Herod, somewhere around 957 B.C. And it was a, a very, very large building. It took up a whole mountainside. And we're told that some of the uh, bricks or some of the stones that uh, they, they had were like 40 feet long and 18 feet high. That's a big stone. It took them 46 years to build this temple. And then Jesus says to his disciples, you see all these stones? There won't be one stone of these standing upon the other 
they will all be thrown down. Well, you can just imagine what that must have meant to the disciples. Not only did they kind of think, well, how's he going to do that? But probably it went through their mind, but wait, this is what gives us purpose. This is where we come to find meaning for our lives. What's he saying? Jesus says, all of this, all of this will be changed. So it's no wonder when they went across the Kidron Valley and up the uh, Mount of Olives and were sitting there that Peter and James and John and Andrew came to Jesus privately, Scripture says, and asked Jesus, you know, when's all this going to happen? And when it does happen, what's going to be the sign that it's all been accomplished? Well, Jesus didn't answer that question directly at that point. But if you go over into chapter, or excuse me, the same chapter 13, but verse 32, find the first thing that we need to listen to today. Jesus said to the disciples, But of that time and day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels who are in heaven, nor the Son but only the Father. Take heed, watch, for you do not know when the time is to come. Take heed, watch. One of the things that we have seen throughout the ages is that people have tried to determine what God's calendar is. And so they have set many different dates. Uh, I can think of at least three or four times in my lifetime that I've heard stories of so-and-so saying at such-and-such a date, the world is going to end. But we all know that that hasn't happened. And many people have asked the question, when do we think the world's going to end? And in 19, uh, around the 1970s, I guess, there was uh, uh, that great series, the, uh, the great, late great planet Earth, where everybody got all excited thinking that that series proved that God was coming on such and such a date, 1988. But it didn't happen. The first thing that I think God wants us to understand today and to be warned about is not to be people who are calendar people, trying to find out when God will act. For God will act when God's ready to act. Uh, I spoke with Dan Kip this week, and we had a good conversation. And in the conversation, we both mentioned how God's timeline is not our timeline. After all, he made the people of Israel wander around for 40 years in the wilderness. And I don't think they would have done that if it was up to them. God's timeline is not ours. God says to us that he will come when he will come. So the first thing that we need to pay attention to today is not to be calendar people. But the second thing, and the good news in our scripture lesson this morning, comes around um, around verse 26. Yeah, 26. This is the second thing that we need to pay attention to today. And then Jesus said, after he told them about all the terrible things, he said, there's going to be tribulation. The sun won't shine anymore. The moon won't shine. The stars will fall from the sky. It will be dark. It just sounded like terrible, terrible things are going to happen. But then he says, but then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. They will see the Son of Man coming with great power and glory. And he says, and then they will send out all of his angels to the four winds and to the ends of the earth that they may gather their elect together. This is the good news. We don't have to worry about the calendar because we know from what Jesus teaches us that history is not moving towards an undetermined future but that God is still in control. Among my top five favorite hymns is This Is My Father's World. I think we've already sung that since I've been here. And I like all the verses, but I particularly find comfort when I listen to the news, especially this week, and learn that 129 people, innocent people, were killed 
while attending a concert or eating in a restaurant or just going about their usual day's living. When we hear stories about people who had to leave their homes because of the evil that was coming their way, and now they don't know where they're going to end up. In times like that, I remember the last verse of this song, This Is My Father's World, when the writer says, This is my father's world, and though the wrong seems oh so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my father's world. He said, Why should my heart be sad? Let the heavens ring. Let the earth be glad. I believe that one of the things that God wants to warn us about is not to lose hope, but to know that the God who led the people out of Egypt in a very troubled time is the God who will lead us through this time as well. God has a plan for history, and we believe that that plan is going to be fulfilled in God's time. This is the hope that we live by as disciples of Jesus Christ. It's the hope that I think the world needs to hear today. This is the word that Jesus shared with his disciples. And prior to sharing these words, he said to them, you're going to be persecuted. You're going to be brought before the authorities and the governors, and they're going to test you and challenge you. But he says that's not the end of the time. The end of time comes when we will see the Son of Man come in the clouds with great power and glory. And then, the third thing that I think we need to pay attention to today is that God does not want us to watch idly. You know, when uh, Paul wrote the letter to the Thessalonians, he wrote that letter because there were some in the church who felt that, well, if God's coming so soon, why should we be doing anything? So they did nothing. And the Apostle Paul writes to them and tells them that you know, God doesn't expect you to be idle. If we go back over to the 33rd verse of this 13th chapter. Right after Jesus says, no one's going to know the day, the hour, or the time. And he gives them a little parable. And he says, look, it's like this. A, ma a master leaves his house to go on a journey. And he puts his servants, now listen to this, he puts his servants each with his work. Each with his work. And then he commanded the doorkeeper to be on the watch. For <clears throat> Watch, therefore, he said, for you do not know when the master of the house will come. It may be in the evening. It may be at midnight. It may be at cockscrow, or it may be in the morning, lest he come suddenly and he finds you sleeping. And Jesus ends the discourse by saying, What I say to you, I say to all. Watch. Jesus knew very well that there would be time between his leaving this world and God sending him again for a second time into the world. And he also knew that he did not want his church, his people, to be idle. He didn't want us to run off to the top of some mountain and wait for God to come. He didn't want us to run into a desert and sit there sweating until the final day. But rather, he said, we're kind of like the servants that God gave his work to. And he says, you've got to be doing the work. Lest the servant comes or the master comes home and he finds you sleeping. Some of us on Thursday evening went to, uh, up to the Giant Center and we heard Dr. David Jeremiah. And one of the major themes in Dr. Jeremiah's uh, message that evening is that we as Christians have to begin to stand up and do what God has called us to do. Because the world certainly isn't doing it. We must do his work. God did not give us a calendar of his days, but he gave us a commission. Go into all the world, teaching all nations, baptizing and teaching my commandments to all people, making disciples of all people. Watch, he says, but do not watch idly. 
We must be involved in doing God's work because that's what God expects of us. We cannot be like the church at Thessalonica who just sat around waiting, but rather we must be those who are actively involved in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. We do that in so many different ways, but probably the best way to do it is simply to share your story. How's God acting in your life today? What's happening in your life today where you see the presence of God at work? What's happening in the life of Winterstown United Methodist Church? What's the good news that we have to share with those who are around us? If we share our story with someone else and they share their story with another person, then we will fulfill this great commission that God has given us. One person can't do it all alone. Jesus knew that. That's why he called 12. We must all be at work, as the parable said, doing his work, each of us. So this morning, we have a warning not to hold on to our calendars trying to figure out the day and the time and the hour when Jesus will come. We have a warning that he is coming again. That's the good news this morning. He is coming again. And we have a warning that until he comes, we must be actively serving as his ministers in this world. He didn't ask us to move, but I believe in the 13th chapter of Mark's gospel, he did ask us to listen and to be aware. Join me in prayer. Father, I thank you for these words this morning. We, we, we would rather skip over this 13th chapter because the images there are uncomfortable to us. But you know, O oh God, that they are put there for a purpose. To warn us as you warned your disciples in their time that calendar watching is not our job, but it's God's job. To remind us of the good news that no matter how wrong the world may get, that yet their time will come when the darkness will be overcome by the light. For you have promised us that since that light came into the world, the darkness cannot overcome it. And Father, we do pray today that you would help us to be actively involved in the work that you have given us. We pray these things today in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. And now will you stand with me as we join in singing together, Lift High the Cross. <coughs> <coughs>
to share the good news of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Go in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.